Hasn't this been a sweet time with the Lord this morning? It's been a good moment. But what if God wants it to be more than a moment? Say more than a moment. I believe that's what God wants. In, in fact, there's some specific opportunities that I know about. Um, if, if this is ministered to you, then I know that you would love our upcoming prayer retreat. We're going to set aside not quite 24 hours. We're going to leave on a Friday afternoon, go about an hour and a half north, and we've got places to stay and food, and Pastor Zach are going to lead you through a time that's like a prayer summit. We're just seeking the face of God. Our first time of doing this as a church. It's going to be great. You can sign up. You can put that on your schedule more than a moment. Uh, This Wednesday, we're starting back House of Prayer, and that's kind of what this service has been modeled after, where we just spend time intentionally in prayer before the Lord. This Wednesday, we'll be meeting in the chapel because our student ministry is growing, and we we want to utilize this gym area for them, Uh, but I, I want to encourage you to come to our House of Prayer. That's a way to schedule a moment. But what if it's more than your schedule? What if it's an encounter with God that changes you? Uh, you've had some of those life changing moments, right? A trauma, maybe something like an automobile accident, death in your family, birth or adoption. Those moments that just cause you to recognize, wow, life is changing. What about spiritually? Do you have some of those spiritual, life-changing moments? I I can think back to when I was 12 years old. I was at Camp McCall up in the mountains above Pickens, South Carolina. It was a boys' camp where we would go. It was a spiritual camp, and we were challenged. And on the last night of camp, the call was extended that maybe God was calling some of these young men who were present to to give their lives to him in vocational ministry. And it was unmistakably clear in my life. And I I remember walking down that aisle at that chapel up on the top of the mountain, and there were tears coming down my eyes. I knew God was calling me. It's about three and a half hours from where I lived in Hartsville, South Carolina. By the time I'd made that three and a half hour drive home, I'd kind of talked myself out of that and thought God was confused. He didn't know what he meant. I didn't realize that they would all automatically send a letter to the pastor who happened to be my dad. So when he got the letter, he said, hey, do you want to talk about this? But I spent the next several years kind of just pulling away from that until another God moment. When I was a junior in college, I had my map all, my life all mapped out and knew exactly what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go next in school and in career. And, and you know, I knew I didn't have God's peace. So I, uh, I knelt by my little twin bed in that apartment And I said, God, the answer is yes. I I don't know how it looks or what it means, but the answer is yes. And really surrendered to that call he had given me in that other God moment. I I remember more than 20 years ago being with hundreds of thousands of men on the mall in Washington, D.C. at a Promise Keepers event. and, And just being challenged to surrender to the Lord. And I remember putting my nose in the dirt there outside of the Smithsonian Institute. And just saying, God, I, I want your will in my life. I want to live for your glory in my life. So many God moments. I, I can remember sitting on the back row of a church at a men's conference and, and hearing the, the person preach and hearing him talk about bitterness. And, and I was convicted to the core because I was living with unforgiveness. That's, that's the first time that statement really sunk into me that, you know, that bitterness is that poison you drink while you wait for someone else to die. And I realized that I was chained to unforgiveness and had to give that to the Lord. And it was a God moment. How about you? You have God moments in your life? Scripture's full of these. In fact, the very beginning of Scripture tells us about a God moment. Adam and Eve, <laughs> they're walking and talking with God in the garden. Then they do what he said, don't do, sin. That's how they started this whole thing and messed it up for all of us. But then there was a God moment even after their sin. God cries out to Adam, Adam, where are you? It wasn't because God didn't know, but because God wanted to encounter him. And he did. Moses would have a God moment at the burning bush. He would would encounter the living Christ, the pre-incarnate Jesus. What in the Old Testament is called Jehovah. Jesus would say, I am. And so would the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah's God moment 
becomes one of those more, more worshipful passages in all of Scripture. I'm going to read this, give you a few thoughts from it, give you some takeaway, and then we're going to go. So hold on tight. Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, that's Isaiah, saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying. And, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. This is taking place in 739 B.C., 739 years before Christ. Uzziah dies. He has been predominantly a a good, benevolent leader for the children of Israel. He had led them through a time of prosperity, but about 15 years before his death, he contracted leprosy, and he began to be pulled away, and things began to fall apart. Times were changing for the children of Israel. And here's what I've learned. It's often in seasons of chaos and change that God reveals himself to those who are listening. And I don't know if you're aware, but as I look around me in this world, we're living in times of chaos and change. We need a fresh word from God. We need God to reveal himself to his church, to his followers in such a way that changes us. And that's what he did for Isaiah. What did he reveal? It begins by saying, I saw the Lord. Think about that. What an amazing statement. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That's what I've asked you to think about a couple of times throughout this service. Do you remember those times where you've had that God encounter, those God moments where you saw the Lord? Who's the Lord in this case? Well, John tells us in John 12 and verse 41, it says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and he spoke about him. So again, who did Isaiah see? He saw Jesus. Say Jesus. The pre-incarnate Christ. This is my regular reminder that Jesus did not just show up on the pages of Matthew in the New Testament. He's been there all along. In the beginning was the Word, John says, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. That's why this passage, when he encounters Isaiah, he'll say later, who shall we send and who will go for us? Who is us? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So this is Jesus that's talking to Isaiah. And what's happening? Well, we're introduced to these seraphim. Now, seraphim come from a word seraph, which literally means fiery serpents. So these were angelic beings, but they're not like the little fluffy fat angels you might see in cartoons. These are some serious beings that are about some serious business. What is their business? They're worshiping God with their actions and their words. And that's just a reminder to us. All eternity is going to be spent worshiping God with actions and words. That's why we should practice now. We do it with our words when we're singing songs of praise to him. But we worship also with our actions. In this case, the seraphim were covering their eyes and they were covering their feet, recognizing the holiness of where they were. And then they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then we've got Isaiah's response. I love this 
in the paraphrase of this passage called the message. Listen to what Isaiah says. He says, I said, doom, it's doomsday. I'm as good as dead. Every word I've ever spoken is tainted, blasphemous even. And the people I live with talk the same way, using words that corrupt and desecrate. And here I've looked God in the face, the king, the God of angel armies. Different translations, he says, I'm lost, I'm ruined, I'm undone, I'm as good as dead. Now, why is this important? It's important because the only appropriate response to an encounter with the living God is an increased awareness of our desperate need for Him. If this has been a good God moment for you, you should be beginning to say, man, I need more of you, God. I need more of this time in your presence. I, I, I see me for who I am, and I need help. That's why we cry out to the way maker, the miracle worker, the light in the darkness, because we realize we can't do this on our own. But then notice what happens next. One of the seraphim, it says, comes to Isaiah, and with a live coal in his hand, he'd taken with tongs, he touched his mouth and says, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And right in that one sentence, you see what is the core of all of Scripture. That there is a loving God who cares about you in spite of how much you blow it. In spite of your sinfulness. And he wants to make a way for you to be right with him. Amen. In the Old Testament, this was done on the Day of Atonement. That's what atonement means, to be one with God, at one. And so on the day of atonement, the priest would go and make a big sacrifice for all of Israel, and their sins were atoned for until the next year. <laughs> and then he'd have to go back in and do it over again. And their sins were atoned for until the next year. Isaiah says that this angel, after this encounter with Jesus, comes to him, and he says, your sin is atoned for. Your guilt is taken away. This is amazing because this is what Jesus will do for everybody through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's described in 1 Peter. Listen to this. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last time for your sake. So through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. See, what God did through Jesus is he made a way for you. He atoned for your sin. So that though when you look at God and you see how holy he is, you recognize how needy you are, how sinful you are, you realize you don't have to carry around the weight of that sin, but you can be made right through Jesus Christ. Amen. But it's what happens next that I really want you to understand. What happens to Isaiah after he experiences this encounter with Jesus. It's the same thing that should happen to you. Once you experience a moment with God, you're commissioned for ministry with him. My friend Dennis Peathers, who preached last Sunday, he talked about that this way. He said it's possible to say yes to Jesus, but not say yes to his mission. And most of you here, you've said yes to Jesus, but a lot of you have not joined him in the ministry that he's called you to. And that's what I want you to get as your takeaway today. That God, remember, he, he wants this to be more than a moment. This, this is never supposed to be just something you check a box and that meets your needs until the next Sunday. Or the next, or the next, whenever you can get here. No, this is kind of a pep rally that encourages us and reminds us of the truth. But we're sent out into this world where we're on mission every day. You are the church where you are. Amen. Not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. And so for Isaiah, he got that challenge from a seraphim. <laughs> then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I. 
it's in me. And I just want to ask you today, are you willing to say, here am I, send me, Lord. Are you willing to write the, and sign the, the blank check and just say, my yes is on the table. However that looks, whatever it, it is. How do you do that? How, how do you make sure you go through life experiencing more than the moment? Let me give you three things and then we'll pray. Number one, keep praising the Lord with humility. Say, praise the Lord. That, that's what I want you to make a regular habit in your life. Just to live with an attitude of perpetual praise. It's a perspective change. It's what Isaiah experienced that day. When he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and whoa, that made me drop to my knees. Because whoa is me. God high, me low. And down here, regardless of what I encounter down here, what's not changing is God's high. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of our praise. Keep praising him. When you praise God in spite of the circumstances, powerful things happen. Chains begin to break around you. I saw a living example of this last week in Greece. Let me first remind you of this story from Acts chapter 16. The Bible says about midnight, Paul and Silas, who were in prison, were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. So last week, we visited in Greece, the city of Philippi. Philippi is where Paul went after he got his call from God. It was the Macedonian call. So that part of Greece is still called Macedonia. It's the Macedonian region. So Paul left what is modern-day Turkey. He sailed across the water. He came into Greece. He went to Philippi. There he met a lady named Lydia. And Lydia, a woman, became the first convert to Christianity in Europe. She was baptized there in Philippi. And then Paul and Silas and his team, they began to minister there in Philippi. But the Philippians did not like it, and they got thrown into jail. In fact, we went and visited the place that we believe is the jail that Paul and Silas were in when what we just read took place. Here they were, literally imprisoned. Everything about their circumstances was bad. So what did they do? They praised the Lord. Amen. I just want to challenge you, regardless of your circumstances, decide to praise the Lord. In fact, why not make it a habit that when something doesn't go the way you want it to go, just insert those words. Just say, praise the Lord. So when you get that call from the doctor you don't want, just say, praise the Lord. When you open your bank app and realize, uh-oh, we're kind of low here, just praise the Lord. When your football team doesn't show up on the field, you just praise the Lord. Whatever it is, big or small, determine to praise the Lord. And one way from this passage you can do that is just by saying, holy, holy, holy. You're just recognizing that God is different. He's worthy of your praise. But here's the deal. I can't say that word three times and not think of the song that kind of goes that way. How about you? Maybe we would sing this right now, just a little bit of it, okay? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning a song shall rise to worthy of your praise. So keep praising him in humility. But I want you to understand something. 
this place of humility, this woe is me, this brokenness, it's not where we remain as followers of Christ, right? Because he clothes us in his righteousness. We're made to be more and more like Christ. We don't become sinless, but we should begin to sin less, right? So here's the second thing I would challenge you. Keep pursuing holiness. It's important we understand there's a God and we're not Him, but our humility is not an end unto itself. We're to strive for holiness. Peter reminds us of that in another part of this passage we read a while ago. He says, but just as He who has called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it's written, be holy because I am holy. When we truly encounter God in His holiness, we're drawn to want to be like Him. Yes, we fear God in His holiness, but we desire to be like Him. Two days ago, I was reading in one of my devotionals, My Utmost for His Highest, and these were the words of Oswald Chambers. We must continually remind ourselves of the purpose of life. We're not destined to happiness nor health, but to holiness. Did you get that? That's important. We're not destined to happiness or health, but to holiness. Today we have far too many desires and interests and our lives are being consumed and wasted by them. Many of them may be right or noble or good and may later be fulfilled. But in the meantime, God must cause their importance to us to decrease. The only thing that truly matters is whether a person will accept the God who will make him holy. At all cost, a person must have that right relationship with God. So just a quick question for you. Are, are you pursuing holiness? I've been at this a little while. A lot of us struggle with this. And when I think about that, I think about the quote by G.K. Chesterton. He says, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. And so some of you, you've been on this journey toward holiness, but you fail you know, in alcoholism, we call that falling off the wagon. And, and so you've done that in your sinful life, and you've stopped. You found it difficult, so you stopped trying. I'm telling you today, if you want this moment to continue, keep pursuing holiness. Keep praising the Lord with humility. Keep pursuing holiness. And then finally, keep practicing obedience to the call and the commands of Christ. Isaiah's moment with God was turned into a ministry for God. Let me read verse 8 one more time. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Are you ready to say, Here am I, send me? Are you ready to join Jesus in his mission? Let me give you some ways you may respond. For some of you, it's obedience to the disciplines that he describes in Scripture. So, so you've trusted Jesus for your salvation, but, but you're like in the nursery. I mean, you're, you're still drinking the bottle, and you're supposed to be eating meat right now. You're not growing up in your faith, and it's because you're not doing the things he's told you to do. So this stuff we've been doing today, reading scriptures and praying, you're supposed to be doing that on your own every day. So do it. Or, or maybe it's you just compartmentalize things. So God's word says everything you have is his. Did you know that? It really does say that. Every good thing you have came from God. It all belongs to him. And some of you said, I love you, Jesus, but I don't believe that. Because you're not living that way. You're not faithful and giving back to the Lord and you're selfish with what you have and, and you're wondering why life is not what you want it to be. All right? For some of you, there's just, um, you're kind of playing that covert Christianity. You're like a secret agent, which is not in Scripture. And so you say, yeah, Pastor Paul, I know I'm going to heaven when I die, but you're, you're, not, you're not living in a way that others know you follow Christ. Tell somebody! Uh, for others of you, there's just something you're not doing that he's asked you to do. 
Maybe it could be as simple as believer's baptism. I've got some friends I'm so proud of. Yesterday afternoon, I walked across the street to see my neighbors and my friends who are here in service every week, Pete and Shirley, and they're senior adults who've lived a good life, and God's blessed them in different ways in life. But sometime back, after knowing they have a relationship with Christ, it became aware to them that they had not followed Christ in obedience and believer's baptism. And uh, Shirley's got some help things, so climbing into this tub here is probably not the easiest thing for her. And so we just began to talk, and I said, why don't I come over and baptize you in your pool or baptize you in my pool? And so yesterday we did that, and it made my weekend just to see this, this dear couple just exercise obedience and just do something that's not going to be whether or not, that wasn't a determining factor on whether or not they go to heaven, but it's, it's just something that says, yes, I'm, I'm living in obedience to the things God said to do. I've, I've said yes to the things he said to do. And by the way, if you need to do that still, come to the beach this afternoon. I'd love to baptize you and, and see that smile come on your face, just as I saw it come on Pete and Shirley's yesterday afternoon. But for some of you, there's a bigger step. There's some of you here, and you may be 12 like I was. You may be a teenager or a college student, or you may be a senior adult or somewhere in between. But you know in your heart that God's called you to give your all and serve him in some way with your life vocationally. And you've held back, and you're miserable. And here's what I want you to do today. It's simple. I just want you to say, here I am. Send me, Lord. All right, let's stand together. Now, I've talked as if we're all followers of Jesus. And the truth is, in a crowd this big, that's probably not the case. If you've never begun a relationship with Christ, that means that right now you're still separated from God. You're not at one with Him. And so what you need to do is to understand that everything we've talked about today is so that you could be right with God. And uh, man, there would be nothing that could make this day better for me or for any of our pastors than to have the chance to talk to you about what it means to say yes to Jesus. And so when I finish praying in just a moment and we begin to sing, if you need to say yes to Jesus, I want you to step out of your seat, walk down the aisle, take the hand of one of the pastors who will be standing here and just say, I need to say yes to Jesus. There's some people here that need to say yes to his mission. And for some of you, that's your vocation. And so what you need to do is step out of your seat and come down and say, I, I think maybe God's calling me serve him with my vocation. How, how do I do that? What's the next step? Others of you may just say, man, this is wrestling with me in my soul and you just need to come and kneel and pray or come and ask someone to pray with you or bring somebody and come and pray with you. But don't miss this moment. I think God wants more than a moment for what we've done here. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare we need you. We can't do this thing called life without you. So in the chaos and change of the world around us, just as you did to Isaiah, would you reveal yourself to us? And Lord, just as Isaiah did to you, may we be faithful to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Call your servants to yourself even now. In Jesus' name, amen. You come as we worship, you come. Lord, I need you. Oh